Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Jellinger. I'm a medical editor, editor of Clinical Endocrinology News, and I'm here today at the tw 21st uh, annual meeting of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. And I have three thyroid specialists with me. To my left is Dr. Hussein Garib from Mayo Clinic. To my right is Dr. Rhoda Coburn from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And furthest on my right is Dr. Dan Dewick from Phoenix, Arizona. So the first uh, uh, question I'd like to uh, uh, ask is to Dr. Garib, and this uh, revolves around uh, the recent studies that were published in the archives in April, Archives of Internal Medicine, with new findings relating to uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and subclinical hyperthyroidism. And of interest is the fact that you'll be moderating an important thyroid session on Sunday, where this topic is definitely going to come up. So the study, as you uh, may well know, uh, indicated that uh, there is in fact cardiovascular risk associated with untreated subclinical hyperthyroidism and untreated subclinical hypothyroidism. I found that very interesting. What do you think about those studies and the current uh, knowledge in that area? Uh, these uh, recent studies uh, more or less confirm what we already know, that subclinical hyperthyroidism is associated with a significant increased risk for uh, cardiac arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation. In fact, the recent study suggests that more than 40% risk, whereas previously it was a threefold increased risk for uh, hyperthyroidism and atrial fibrillation. The hypothyroidism also shows that, illustrates that uh, uh, hypothyroidism can accelerate uh, atherogenesis and cardiac disease. <coughs> And so both uh, mild hypothyroidism uh, or subclinical hypothyroidism as well as uh, uh, hyperthyroidism can be associated with significant cardiac disease. Right, I think it was interesting in that study that the, in subclinical hypothyroidism, the patients at risk were primarily the younger patients for accelerated cardiovascular disease and not the older individuals, uh, just a curiosity. So your personal uh, 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 treatment or your individual treatment of patients with subclinical disease is largely to treat patients who have TSH below what or above what? Uh, in general, I favor uh, uh, treatment uh, of patients with subclinical hypothyroidism if TSH levels are more than five uh, and uh, associated with uh, significant risks such as presence of a goiter, presence of antithyroid antibodies, or family history for uh, heart disease, or associated with uh, hyperlipidemia. In patients with uh, subclinical hyperthyroidism, if TSH is less than 0.1, I think uh, these pa patients should be treated. For TSH is between 0.1 and 0.5, observation and careful follow-up seems reasonable. Thanks very much, Dr. Grieb. Dr. Coben, since this is such a controversial subject and we've really not known exactly what to do with these patients whose TSHs are not normal, what's your individual or personal approach to treat uh, patients with subclinical thyroid disease? Well, I, I think like Dr. Garib, one tries to individualize uh, with the patient. You take the statistics and apply them as best you can to the individual patient sitting in front of you. For subclinical hyperthyroidism, we've always had this gray zone between 0.1 and 0.4, and just the presence of the more sensitive assays, of course, has allowed us to separate out this group. Um, it's hard to know whether or not they are going to progress. About a third of those people will actually revert back to normal thyroid status over time. So I think it's important to observe for a while before you uh, necessarily treat, unless, as Dr. Grieb said, there are other factors that put these people at risk. Uh, below 0.1, I don't think anybody disagrees with that, and I think we all treat particularly in the elderly or people who are at risk for um, atrial fibrillation as well as um, for uh, bone loss in postmenopausal women. So that's another category of people that we would consider treating. For subclinical hypothyroidism, it's even more complicated because up until the study that you're mentioning, uh, the previous studies have been uh, very mixed and very controversial, as you mentioned. Um, I think what is interesting with the RAPSI study is that they finally did uh, treat some people and compare treated people versus people who were untreated. And as mentioned, the younger people probably um, received the most benefit from treatment. So it's clear that uh, younger people who will have more time at risk were more eager to treat, whereas the elderly, as we know, often run 
higher TSH levels in general, that tends to be more typical of uh, their age group, and probably are more at risk if they are euthyroid or certainly subclinically hyperthyroid, whereas hypothyroidism in other studies has been associated actually with longevity in some of the studies of older than 85. So um, with the elderly people, we tend to be very cautious uh, not to jump to treat <coughs> subclinical hypothyroidism. But with younger people, I think it's quite fine to try to keep them in the euthyroid range. Well, thanks very much. Dr. Dewick, you're going to be speaking Sunday uh, at, a, at a session uh, and covering uh, the thyroid nodule, at least discussing cases that involve thyroid nodular disease. So uh, what's new in, in, the, in the management, the assessment, and the treatment of thyroid nodules? Uh, there's quite a few things, I think. Let me just kind of enumerate them. Let's just start off with uh, the thyroid nodule itself. Where we're at with that, everybody's familiar with the fact that we use ultrasound to further identify thyroid nodules from a risk standpoint. If there's things that we see in the field, such as lymph nodes or other characteristics of the gland or the shape or size of the nodule, these are all things that may impact as well as findings in the texture of the nodule on the risk of the nodule. We then have a set of guidelines that we apply to this and we perform usually a needle biopsy on those that show risk. And when we apply the needle biopsy, about one in five times we come back with a situation where the nodule is actually indeterminate. And when it's classified as indeterminate, it means we can't really tell the difference between a nodule being benign versus malignant. And within the characteristics of benign, there can be other features, which we call atypia or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. There can be suspicious for follicular nodule or follicular neoplasm or herthal cell nodule or herthal cell neoplasm. So they make up the greatest population of indeterminate biopsies. Those that are actually suspicious for malignancy or frankly malignancy are usually operated on. But this large group left behind has uh, left uh, the whole field of needle biopsy kind of in question. And so we moved forward in molecular biology and actually applied somatic mutations as well as messenger RNAs, as well as a number of other sub um, molecular particles uh, which identify these nodules more efficiently. And what we're really looking at is a situation where even in this indeterminate group, the risk of malignancy remains low. It's as low as 5% to as high as 40%, but it's certainly not above 50, 60, or 70%. So when we run into this situation, we now have the ability to apply molecular markers, and the one panel is these messenger RNAs, and one company has these as 142 messengers, which help differentiate benign versus malignant. And on the other side, we have another company which has identified a, a whole host of somatic mutations, including BRAF, including markers for uh, papillary cancer, and some markers for follicular cancer. And this panel allows us also to utilize this as an approach to cancer. So this has been more or less the approach that's applied more recently. Recently, a couple of these tests have become commercially available. Well, thanks very much. There's a lot going on with thyroid disease, uh, new concepts with old, old diseases, and I personally look forward to these presentations over the next few days to hear more, more about all this information. Thank you for your attention.